All right. So good morning again, another session fluids. Today, I'm hoping we can uh, finish up with mass conservation. I put your homework three. Today is going to be due next week, Sunday, midnight. So you have about 10 days to do it. There are um, five problems in it. The focus is going to be on mass conservation. You're going to need to use the integral form and the differential form. So you'll, you know, you'll have to figure out which one is going to work best for the problem you're dealing with. The integral form is generally going to be helpful when you're looking at the bulk flow, you know, and the differential form is going to be more relevant when you're looking at the details of the velocity field at a point. Okay. Last time we left off with the, we derived the continuity equation from the, um, we applied the Reynolds transport theorem to mass. Oh, there's not a single marker that's working today. Let's see, this one. And continuity equation, or the equation of mass conservation, and we said, partial rho by partial t plus div rho u is equal to zero, okay? Now this applies, this is the Eulerian form. So if you have a flow in a pipe or something and fluid is going on like this, this is looking at a fixed point, rho and u, okay? Rho and u fixed point in space okay you're not following the material anymore that's the power of this equation and of um, this formulation okay so i want to use now this equation to make two arguments two mathematical arguments that are a little bit intuitive but looking at the math to describe what we mean by incompressible flow Okay, and to challenge some of the ideas that you might have held previously about when a flow is incompressible. Okay, but first we need to look at something called the material derivative or the substantial derivative. Okay, so I need some volunteers now to remind me or to tell us if they've heard of the material derivative. Material derivative derivative or substantial derivative substantial derivative okay so who's heard of the material derivative and who thinks they remember what it means go ahead Luz. Uh, what it means yeah it means that you're following a point throughout the, the flow. Okay, and then, so we've been following points all along, right? <laughs> so, so you're right, but what does it physically, intuitively mean? And why do we need it? Okay. The, at least who has seen it and didn't really understand what they learned about it in undergrad because I didn't when I learned it in undergrad I was like okay whatever okay no feedback <laughs> okay 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 so then I hope this tangent will be useful all right, suppose for a moment, I concocted this example last year. Um, suppose that there is a factory. You know, like, there's a factory and, you know, it's just kind of producing stuff and materials. And there is a river close by. Notice that many factories love to build close to bodies of water for cooling needs, to dump some stuff. <laughs> um, and suppose that this factory is, um, you know, 
dumping a benign residue, okay, in the river, okay. However, that residue has some, causes some discoloration in the water, um, or it doesn't cause some discoloration. It just in, is invisible, but it changes something in the water. So it adds a concentration, okay. So they dump it and kind of, the river is flowing like this at a speed u, and you know they dump this material. Clearly, you know it's coming in at a concentration c, and then as it goes in the water, it kind of just dilutes, right? So you have higher concentration here, high concentration, intermediate concentration, right? Intermediate concentration, and then kind of low concentration over here, correct? Because it just dilutes, right? That's kind of, that's normal. Um, now, suppose that, okay, so, so knowing this, then we know that there is a gradient of concentration in this direction, right? Because the gradient always points in the direction of high concentration, right? And suppose that this is just one dimensional for simplicity. So this is dc by dx, okay? It points in this direction towards the high gradient, okay? Now you are a graduate student working with uh, someone here in the department and you are tasked with measuring the concentration. Okay, so you come in, okay? And you have this, uh, you have like a stick and you throw in a probe over here that measures concentration, okay? And you just, Put it there and we're just reading the concentration continuously, okay? Now, suppose that your colleague wants to have some more fun in measuring the concentration. So they go and there's a boat rental place here. Boat rental, okay? You have a bunch of canoes, a bunch of things. So, you know, your friend goes and rents a canoe, okay? And then they stand on the canoe after signing a non-disclaimer you know, agreement that they're, you know, take full responsibility for, you know, risking their lives, that. And then they use the same probe and throw it over here. And of course, they're moving at the same speed as the river, right, U. So they're moving at the speed U, okay? Now your question is, my question to you is, what is the concentration? What is the concentration in the river? For this person, from their perspective, they're only seeing a change in concentration over time, right? Because in the, on their detector, they're plotting, this is time, and this is concentration. So initially, over here, there's zero concentration, right? Nothing, they're not measuring anything. And then suddenly, once they hit this point, let's call this point A, they measure a peak concentration, which is the highest in this case, because we see it as observers. And then as they continue floating down the river, we call this point B, if we'll use it later. As they continue floating through the river, so the concentration is C, then they start at B, and then it's probably something like this, okay? That's what they would measure. Now this person, I'm you gonna know, try to create the same kind of plot. What they're measuring, we're gonna assume that conditions are steady and smooth and nice and, and essentially do not change over time for now. This person is measuring the same concentration throughout the day because the power plant, the factory is dumping the same amount continuously, nonstop, the river water is not turbulent, nice and smooth, there's no crazy mixing going on. So this person is measuring this concentration all the time, okay? Now, let me ask you this. When this person crosses this point, crosses the probe, they should measure the same concentration as this person has is measuring, correct? So at point B, if this is point B, 
then this point should correspond to that same value over here. However, for this individual, there is a concentration, there's a change in concentration in time, right? For this person, there's not, okay? So how can we relate the two to each other? This is important because when you send a hot air balloon in the atmosphere to measure things, that balloon is moving, okay, with the speed of the atmosphere or a different speed, okay? And it's measuring things. But what is the true concentration in the atmosphere? Is it the one measured by the balloon? Is it the one measured by a fixed probe in the atmosphere? How do you get the truth? How do you see the truth? What is the truth there? So we need to relate what this person is seeing to a fixed observer, to what a fixed observer would see, okay? Because this fixed observer, if they move over here, they're gonna be able to measure this point, which corresponds to that guy, correct? So how do we relate the two? That will be the objective of the material derivative. All right, so let's do this together. We're gonna to do it in one dimension for simplicity and see what happens. Okay, so now suppose in a, we're gonna take a very small element of the river of distance delta x, very small distance, such that you know, this is the person on the canoe coming in with the probe, okay? They hit concentration C1, C0 over here and concentration C1 over there, such that C0 is greater than C1. That doesn't matter, but, you know, just for the simplicity. <clears throat> and they are spaced by a distance delta X, okay? Now C1, Mathematically, we know that C1, because it's so close to the location of C2, can be expressed in terms of C2 and the gradient between C0 and C1, okay? So in other words, you could say C1 is equal to C0 plus delta X times the rate of change of C. Agreed? That's just a simple Taylor series. Okay, so approximately C1 is this guy. And as delta X shrinks to zero, you know, then we can get this exact, this becomes exact, okay? Now, what is dc by dt as measured by the person on the boat? It is the limit as delta t approaches zero, okay? So the person on the boat is measuring c0 and then after an interval of time, also delta t, they're measuring c1, right? So for the observe, for the person on the boat, the rate of change they're measuring is limit as delta t approaches zero of C1 minus C0 over delta t, okay? Now we express C1 as this formula, which is the limit delta t approaching zero of C0 plus delta x dc by dx minus C0 over delta t. C0 nicely disappears. Then you get limit as delta t approaches zero of delta x over delta t, dc by dx, okay? Now, what is delta x over delta t? Velocity, right? Because delta x is u times delta t, right? The distance traveled by the person on the boat is simply the velocity, it's velocity times the time interval. So when you do that, delta T disappears and you get U DC by DX, okay? That's critical because for the person measuring this, they see this, now they can translate this curve into a spatial gradient. So take a hot air balloon, take it up the atmosphere at a certain speed it's gonna give you a curve as a function of time. Then I ask you, what is the gradient of ozone in the atmosphere? It's, you take dc by dt, which you've measured, take the slope of, of this curve, and you set that equal to the speed of the hot air balloon, and you find the concentration, the gradient of ozone. This is very powerful. You only know this because you're studying mechanics. 
You cannot imagine how many times I've spoken with folks who are coming from non-engineering or physics backgrounds who cannot see this, who say, oh, this is just dc by dt. That's the gradient. No, that's not the gradient. The gradient is u. The gradient is 1 over u dc by dt. That's the gradient. Now, this is extendable in general to three dimensions. dc by dt is simply u dot grad c. Okay. All right. That's not sufficient, though. There's also one more thing we can add to this. Now, what if, what if this is radioactive material <laughs> and it's also decaying over time? So it's coming in, but it's also decaying over time as well. So at every, there's a change in space from our perspective, but also there's a local change in time. Okay, there's also a local change in time. Turns out you can do the same analysis, okay? And I am going to leave that derivation for you. You can look it up on the YouTube. But in that case, this becomes a function of time. And if you introduce time into the equation, then what you get is dc by dt is equal partial c by partial t, which is the local change due to the radioactive decay, okay, plus u dc by dx. Or in general, in three dimensions, you get dc by dt equal partial c by partial t plus u dot grad c. And this is the material derivative. Now we typically write this as d, this capital D, d phi by dt is equal partial phi by partial t plus u dot grad phi. Material derivative or substantial derivative. Now for fluid flows or, you know, I gave you the example of the probe, but for this equally applies to a, to a fluid flow. If you consider a fluid element, like we considered the system before, okay? This is the same thing. In other words, this is the differential equivalent of the Reynolds transport theorem, except that that system is infinitesimally small. This is the equivalent of the Reynolds transport theorem. This is the differential equivalent of the Reynolds transport theorem, okay? Now, the material derivative applies to essentially a material point. We call it material point or material system. Material means you're tracking the material, the fluid, okay? Or a probe, a sensor moving with the fluid, okay? This velocity is really the velocity of the probe. In fluid flow, the probe is a fluid element or a, or a fluid point, which has the same velocity as the fluid flow, right? Okay. I hope this rings a bell. I hope you've seen it potentially in undergrad. You might have seen it as acceleration of a fluid particle or whatnot and whatnot. I think this is more powerful way to explain it, looking at a probe, how it moves with the fluid with this example. Okay. So why do I need this now? I need it to prove to you to discuss incompressibility, okay? So what is incompressible flow? And what is the physical and the mathematical meaning of, meaning of incompressible flow? Pardon me. It's the derivative is zero, so the flow is. Which derivative? The derivative of the velocity. Which one? Like, like the gradient or the divergence of the velocity. 
yeah, so the divergence, we, we mentioned that last time. Okay, but why is that? So we mentioned last time our argument was that there is no net flow. Whatever is coming in cannot be compressed, it has to leave. Okay, so let me ask you this now. I'm gonna take a balloon, has air in it, and somehow magically, I'm gonna put in some droplets of water and some droplets of oil. I'm gonna shake it. Is the flow in the balloon compressible or incompressible? So you know water is incompressible. Intuitively, you can't really compress it. Oil is not compressible. The air in the balloon is not really compressible at that at those temperatures and pressures. Or forget the air. Let's just have water and oil. So you have a change in density, right? The density changes from one point to another. At one point, there's oil. At one point, there's water, right? The density is changing in space and also on, in time because as the particles move around at different points, at one time, you're going to have a particle that has a, a water in it, droplet, and one time, you're going to have a particle that has oil. So what is the flow in that case? It is incompressible, definitely incompressible. Because the individual elements are incompressible. But how do we prove this? I'm going to show you a way to do um, one argument for incompressibility. So, incompressibility argument one. Okay. So, we're going to take the continuity equation, this one, d rho by dt plus div rho u is equal to zero. Now I'm gonna split this guy, okay? So d rho by dt plus rho div u, okay, let me write it in a different way, plus u dot grad rho plus rho div u. Again, this is a vector identity, okay? The divergence of a times a vector is a div of the vector plus vector dot grad of the scalar. Okay. Now, what is this? That's the material derivative of the density for a fluid point. Right? D rho by dt plus rho div u is equal to zero. Okay. For an incompressible flow, now we're gonna talk about the density. Last time we spoke about the mass for a system. We said the system's mass doesn't change, right? But that didn't tell us anything about compressibility or incompressibility because all it's saying is that the mass of that system does not change. But an argument for incompressibility can be made on the density by saying that for an incompressible fluid or an incompressible flow, the density of a material point, think of the droplet of water in the balloon or the droplet of oil. There's no way to compress that. If you compress it, it's gonna squeeze out, it's gonna change its shape, but the volume is going to be the same and its density is going to be the same. In other words, whatever you do to the material point, its density is never going to change. So for incompressible flow, compressibility, d rho by dt is equal to zero. Not that the density is constant everywhere. If you have the density constant everywhere, then this implies d rho by dt equal to zero. But take the water, the water oil example. Water and oil, okay? You have water and you have oil. So water, oil, okay? The density is not constant in space over here. At different points, you have different densities. However, the flow is still incompressible because you're not squeezing, you cannot squeeze these material points. You cannot change their densities individually. That is the true, when, when somebody, tell, when they ask you, when is the flow incompressible? 
don't say when the density is constant. That's only a special case. If the density is constant everywhere, then that necessarily means that this is the case. But in general, that's not the case. It's only when this combination is equal to zero. When d rho dt plus u dot grad rho is equal to zero. Okay. You can, for, for example, concoct a flow field where rho um, where the, where rho is doesn't change in time, but u and grad rho are perpendicular. So flow is going up and the density gradient is in this direction. And that flow is incompressible. Okay. So you have to distinguish between incompressible fluid and incompressible flow. You might have a fluid like air that could be compressed, but the flow could be in a way that it is incompressible if it satisfies this condition, okay? Now this also implies that, necessarily implies that rho div u is equal to zero. Now because rho is not equal to zero, then this implies that div u is equal to zero, which is the famous condition for incompressibility. So this or that are both conditions for incompressibility, but this one is more powerful because it allows you to go to the non-conventional thinking that many assume that the density has to be constant, for example, or does not change in time. Well, it doesn't change in time for a material point, okay, for the droplet of water moving in the flow. But locally, it's gonna change in time because as this water droplet is moving, so suppose you are here and you're measuring density. You have a probe and you're measuring density. Then the, at this point, the density is gonna change because at one time you're gonna have water coming in and another time you're gonna have oil coming in. So your density is gonna change over time. However, the flow is still incompressible because this guy is not changing over time. Okay, and the density of the material points. Okay, let me see. Okay, so I think I still have one more. I still have some time to do. So, so why am I doing this now? You know, these derivations are nice. They expose you to a different way of thinking manipulating the math these mathematical objects to make rational arguments about fluid flows, right? But in the end, this is what matters. This is the conclusion that is gonna matter to you. Now, suppose you're not convinced that the density, you know, is the density is incompressible. It doesn't mean that the density for a material point is changing, it's confusing to you. Here's another argument for incompressibility. Argument two for incompressibility. Consider a material point, again, a fluid, little fluid element. Intuitively, incompressible means you cannot compress it. So if it looks like this at this instant, and suppose you squeeze it, then it's going to look like that at the other instant, but the volume is going to be the same. P0, P0 equal P1. Correct? Whatever shape it takes, the volume is going to be the same. Volume. Okay? Okay? So let's see mathematically what this implies, okay? So we're gonna consider, so this is getting into some nitty gritty math, okay? And in previous versions of this course, there was a lot of this kind of math being done. Okay, so, you know, I like to do some of it um, because again, it exposes you to kind of this differential way of thinking about things. So now consider 
a little fluid element that is moving inside the flow. I'm taking a simple square or rectangle over here for simplicity. It could be any shape, okay? Now, this element is, suppose this is the um, origin, and this material element, uh, this material point, whatever it is, is subjected to forces and displacements from all directions. So suppose over here, it's got a velocity u in the x direction. This point has velocity u, this point has velocity v, okay? And suppose that we only have a gradient in the x direction. So at this point over here, the velocity is u, sorry, this is a scalar, velocity is, is equal to u plus some, the distance over here, delta x, times du by dx, okay? Suppose we only are looking at displacements in the x direction, it makes the math easier. We can do the same in y and z. So what that means is that over here, you still have u and v, okay? And over here, you have v still, and in the y direction, but over here, you have u plus delta x du by dx, okay? So really what's happening to this fluid is, to this material element, the critical displacement is gonna be in this direction, okay? So as this fluid element is subjected to these displacements, and again, I'm not drawing this to scale entirely, then the volume is gonna change a little bit by this much, okay? Is going to change by this much. The distance in this case is now remember this is still a speed, okay? This whole thing is a speed. So the distance that the this has traveled is this velocity delta x du by dx times delta t. The time that this fluid element has traveled. So the change in volume, change in volume is simply delta V is equal to delta X du by dx times delta T times delta Y delta Z because mm -hmm. This is a volume, right? So you have a delta Y over here and you have a delta Z over there, okay? Now delta X, delta Y, delta Z is the original volume. So you get DU by DX, delta T times delta V, okay? Now we said that for incompressible flow, incompressible, flow, there is no, no change in volume, no change in volume of a material point. In other words, d delta v by dt is equal to zero. Okay? Agreed? The, the, you, cannot, the, you cannot change the volume. Kind of weird to think about volume this way, but you can change the volume because it's kind of geometry and then you're putting in rates of change. But this is where this is where this comes in. Okay? So now d delta v by dt is equal to d by dt of this change. Right, it's, it's the volume, the new volume minus the original volume over delta T is just gonna give you this guy, right? So in other words, it's simply gonna be D by DT of DU by DX delta T times delta V, okay? And that will be equal to DU by DX times delta V. 
And now you set that equal to zero. So it gives you this condition, okay? du by dx delta v equal to zero. Delta v cannot be zero, therefore du by dx equals zero in this case. In 3D, if you do the same math. You do it in u, v, and z. It just gets so complicated to do it here, so that's why I choose to do it in 1D. It implies that div u, okay, remember div u is du by dx plus dv by dy plus dw by dz, okay? Div u times delta v is equal to zero. And therefore, div u is equal to zero. So if you are not convinced by the argument for the density, I hope this is a little more, bit more convincing. This derivation, you can see it in the um, in one of the uh, uh, chapters from Monson, Young, and Okishi on the canvas. So they do it in three dimensions. You can follow it very easy like this. And then you'll show that d delta v by dt necessarily implies div u equal to zero. Okay. Now, what is important for you to remember is the intuitive meaning of what it means to be incompressible. Either, either the material point cannot be compressed, the volume does not, what that means is that the volume does not change, or the density of the material point does not change in time. So it is constant wherever that fluid point is located at. Again, if you're riding on that material point, okay? So this guy. Now this does translate to an Eulerian perspective such that zero by dt plus u dot grad rho equals zero. So you could have a complex flow field with looking at it from an Eulerian perspective. You can have density changing in time and density changing in space, but you can build it in a way such that this is equal to zero. The, the fluid itself can be potentially compressible like air. But if it just so happens that the rate of, ch the local rate of change plus u dot grad rho is equal to zero, then by all means, you can consider the flow to be incompressible. So it's one thing to say the fluid is incompressible or compressible. It's another to say the flow itself is incompressible. So you, for a, incompressible fluid like water or oil whatever you do to it the flow is always going to be incompressible but for a compressible fluid like air in general flows with air are compressible but they can also be designed in a way that the flow makes it look like it's incompressible if you satisfy these conditions either this u equal to zero or this guy equal to zero. Okay? That's the power of the math over what you perceive intuitively, okay? Yeah, and I think we are done with the um, mass conservation. On YouTube, Excuse me, on YouTube, if you look, um, I do a derivation to relate, to show that the Reynolds transport theorem and the material derivative are identical. So the material derivative is the differential equivalent of the Reynolds transport theorem. It makes sense because the Reynolds transport theorem told us, translated to us a material Lagrangian description of a system with an integral to an Eulerian description with integrals. The material derivative does the same thing, but for an infinitesimal point, okay? So in other words, you can take the Reynolds transport theorem and shrink the volume to zero, and you'll get the material derivative. So I do that derivation on the YouTube permanent lecture um, lectures playlist, okay, if you're interested in that. It's more 
for your satisfaction if you're curious about it, okay? Your homework is gonna be on mass conservation. And there's one problem on using the material derivative. So I, I, I asked you to send a probe in the atmosphere in your mind, okay? And I asked you to get the density gradient, okay? And the actual value of the density itself, okay? And then there are three other problems. Some of them you have to use the integral form of mass conservation. Some of them you have to use the differential form. Okay. Okay. Next Monday we will start with uh, momentum. Okay, momentum is gonna we're gonna is gonna take us on a long journey. Okay, because we're gonna start with inviscid flows first and look at the rederive the Bernoulli equation. Look at it from entirely different perspective. Dig into some nasty mathematics, and then we get to viscous flows. Okay, and then turbulence. All right. If you want to go, you can go. Or <laughs> okay, y'all have a great weekend. Okay, I'll see you next Monday. Let me...